Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is on the book of Galatians, one of those really challenging books in the New Testament. Written by Paul, of course, and this particular lesson is lesson number three in that series for July 15 of 2017, entitled, The Unity of the Gospel. So you can try to guess what that's going to be talking about. Before we begin, we'd like to ask you to join us in a word of prayer as we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us in our discussion. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the many ways in which you have blessed us. We thank you especially for the scriptures which we have to spread out before so easily accessible in our day compared to the way they used to be in the past. Help us to understand more clearly than we have before the words that were written down by your friend Paul is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Unity and diversity. How do those go together? Well, Paul had some very straightforward things to say about unity and diversity, and let's just start off by reading those. Galatians 3, 28 and 29 says, So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. I mean, that ought to be the end of the discussion, right? Well, over in Colossians 3.11, he says something similar. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, savages, slaves, free, but Christ is all, Christ is in all. So now we can say the benediction and go home. The discussion is finished, right? <laughs> well, it's pretty clear about how Paul felt in all this. It's also true that as the gospel spreads through new cultures, new nations, and new social situations, a certain amount of diversity is going to be introduced. And here's a question I'd like to put to you out there. We're not going to necessarily, we're not going to be able to answer it, but I'd like you to think about it. When we get to heaven, are we all going to be melted into a single culture? Or will we have a whole smorgasbord of cultures, including people who lived at different times over thousands of years, and we're going to have to learn how to get along with all those people with their background? Is that going to be the case, or? Probably wouldn't be too big of a problem because nobody's going to be that that is self-centered. Mm -hmm. So everybody's going to be getting along just great. In fact, there will be a state of atonement. Mm -hmm. That's my observation, anyway. Yeah, I'm going to have to get along with Martin Luther and David. Yeah, well, I've got a question. Can't it can't be worse. In light of Paul's comments. Where did the division between men and women as far as church office start? Yeah. We're still well, I think we're going to get to that a little bit later in our lesson, but uh, very good question. Um, <clears throat> you all should know, those of you out there maybe don't know, that there was a very famous Jewish male prayer. These Jews would wake up in the morning, and Paul probably was among them in his earlier days, saying, I'm thankful, thank you, God, that I'm not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman, and usually in that order. Um, and so this was, a, you can see how Paul is responding to, to that idea. But we looked at some of these people who were like leaders in the Protestant Reformation. Look at John Calvin. Believed that disunity and division were the devil's chief devices against the church. But that same John Calvin did not hesitate to stand up against the recognized church of his time. We all know that. He also thought it was necessary to burn at the stake a Protestant reformer who was an Arian. What would have happened... What's an Arian? I guess we should mention that. An Arian is someone who believes that Christ did not have a pre-existence, that, that when he was born here on this earth, that was the beginning of his life. Now, he is God, he somehow becomes God, but he wasn't there. He didn't have any pre-existence. That's what. There are variations of that, but that's the usual idea of Arians. So in all John Calvin's tolerance, he wasn't able to tolerate someone no. who disagreed. No. Well, what would have happened to Ma if Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, had chosen to conform for the sake of unity instead of standing up for salvation by faith alone? What do you think John Calvin and John and Martin Luther would say about the ecumenical movement? 
Well, they had come to the conclusion that the Pope was the Antichrist and that Rome was was the beast, Babylon. And, and how would they yeah. feel if they knew that their churches were rapidly yeah. reuniting with the, Rome, with the Roman Catholic Church? Yeah. Well, here's what Ellen White says in Great Controversy, page 166. Had the reformers, talking about Martin Luther, had the reformer yielded a single point, Satan and his hosts would have gained the victory, but his unwavering firmness was the means of emanc emancipating the church and beginning a new and better era. So our lesson today will focus on 15 verses. Let me just read them now. This is Galatians 2, 1 to 14. 14 years later, I went back to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. Do you think Titus took, I mean, Paul took Titus along just, just casually for no reason at all? Well, I went because God revealed no, to him. your question. No. <laughs> I went because God revealed to me that I should go. In a private meeting with the leaders, I explained the gospel message that I preach to the Gentiles. I did not want my work in the past or in the present to be a failure. My companion Titus, now he's going to get into that, even though he's a Greek, was not forced to be circumcised, although some wanted it done. Pretending to be fellow believers, these men slipped into our group as spies. What do you suppose they were spying? In order to find out about the freedom we have through our union with Christ Jesus. They wanted to make slaves of us, but in order to keep the truth um, of the gospel safe for you, we did not give in to them for a minute. But those who seemed to be the leaders, how do you like this word, language? I say this because it no, makes no matter, no difference to me what they were. God does not judge by outward appearances. Those leaders, and by the way, who were the leaders at that point in time? Peter, James, Peter. and John. Peter, well, it wouldn't be the James that was the brother of James, right. brother of John. This would be James, the brother of, brother Jesus. of Jesus. But yeah. Peter, James, and John seemed to be the leaders. I say made no new suggestions to me. On the, ca on the contrary, they saw that God had given me the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the task of preaching the gospel to the Jews. For, for by God's power, I was made an apostle to the Gentiles, just as Peter was made an apostle to the Jews. James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be the leaders, recognized that God had given me this special task, so they shook hands with Barnabas and me as a sign that we were all partners. We agreed that Barnabas and I would work among the Gentiles and they among the Jews. All they asked was that we should remember the needy in their group, which is the very thing I have been eager to do. Well, but when Peter came to Antioch, now these are the ones he agrees with down in Jerusalem, one of them, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Before some men who had been sent by James, now there's, there's the second one of these original three, some men who had been sent by James arrived there. Peter had been eating with the Gentile brothers and sisters. But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards along with Peter. Even Barnabas was swept al along by their coward action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? So that's our main passage for today. So... Um, Remember what, 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 what was happening here. In the early Christian church, virtually all the new believers belonged to what group? The Jews. They were Jews. Even, the, even when they scattered out to various places, they were there going and they would go to the synagogues in those places and we would preach only to Jews. And then, as we remember, they read in, in reading in, in Acts uh, 13, it talks about the fact that some people from Cyprus and Cyrene came to Antioch and began to preach the gospel to Gentiles. And then came Barnabas, and then he called Paul, and pretty soon they were, rapid, they were rapidly preaching the gospel to Gentiles as well. And the church started going, just growing like something. And then Paul and Barnabas were set aside, laid their hands on them, set aside to go out to the, to the Gentile territories and preach the gospel. And when they came back, what was the concern of the Jewish believers? They aren't circumcised. 
these people aren't circumcised. And not only that, what are we going to do if suddenly so many Gentiles join the Christian group that there's more Gentiles than there are Jews in our organization? What would we do then? Is there some comparison today? Uh, let's not get too... <laughs> Well, when they were called to, to come down to... So when Paul and Barnabas came back to Antioch after their first missionary journey, this became a huge item of contention. And so they were called to Jerusalem, and that's the conference that was that's spelled out in Acts 15. But they took with them Titus, a Greek, who, and refused to have him circumcised. This forced the Jerusalem group to deal with the issue of circumcision. Now let's talk about that for a second. Why was circumcision an issue? Well, it goes all the way back to Abraham. Okay. It didn't just start at Sinai. It went all the way back to Abraham. So. Mm -hmm. And does it mean that a person is more savable if he's circumcised? They thought so. <laughs> That's not the question I asked. Yeah. <laughs> what was the issue? What was the real issue? The issue was, do you have to obey all the rules that was, were set down in the Old Testament in order to be saved in the do, New but Testament? Part of it, well, part yeah. Of it, for some, the, it would be control. It tied into this working your way to heaven by being perfect. Yeah. The bottom line is, in this situation, the bottom line was, if, if I'm a Jew and I'm circumcised, circumcised Am I willing to sit next to a Gentile at the table and eat with him? Now I want to know, how does it affect the food? Well, a Gentile will eat a lot more different food than a Jew would. Maybe. Maybe. But that, that's not the issue here. Well, it could be. Well, it's not mentioned. It's not mentioned. It, this, this whole issue is nothing but Jewish bigotry. That's what this I is all. I don't think it's completely Jewish bigotry because I think some people were concerned that they weren't getting educated enough to, to of the Jewish background which Jesus came out of to um, to completely understand their conversion. And and I mean that's a that's a valid question. Uh, I'll admit that's a valid question. Paul dealt with a little bit in the, in the church in Corinth. Remember these verses? 1 Corinthians 1, starting with verse 10. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I appeal to all of you, my brothers and sisters, to agree in what you say, so that there will be no divisions among you. Be completely united with only one thought and one purpose. For some people from Chloe's family have told me quite plainly, my friends, that there are quarrels among you. Let me put it this way. Each one of you says something different. One says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Peter. And another, I follow Christ. Christ has been divided into groups. Was it Paul who died on the cross for you? Were you baptized as Paul's disciples? I mean, you can see that he's flaying it to the kilt there. Well, we have, as humans, we have a tendency to fractionalize start groups and when groups start having to deal with each other they get they get kind of scared of each other or something and and it just it's 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 a satanic thing. how how yeah how are we supposed to respond if we run across somebody who thinks a little different than we do well first of all how right are we yeah you know god Absolutely. god is right and yet he's got enough patience to deal with us. Mm -hmm. So why can't we have enough de patience to deal with somebody that we think is wrong? Yeah, exactly. Well, well, I look, think Ellen White says that we should sit down with them and open our Bibles and share the reasons for our understanding. And, uh, what do you think the early church had in mind when they said, okay, Peter, it's your job to preach to the Jews. Paul, it's your job to preach to the Gentiles. What do you think they had in mind? Anybody? Did they think that the message that Peter and Paul were going to present was exactly the same? Well, it was a little bit different. The, those that are going to the Jews bring in the Old Testament. Those that, that are going to the Gentiles, there's no background in the Old Testament okay. in, in those people. They have no understanding, so they're, they're coming at it differently. 
Okay. You know, you know, it seemed like Paul, when he went to the pagan places, he kind of knew what was going on. So maybe he was a little more, he had a background with... with well, he grew with up in other. a pagan society, didn't he? Yeah, so yes. he would be a good guy to, to pick mm -hmm. to do that, just because of that. I think it's interesting that it's Peter, the one who's preaching to the Jews that was, that had the experience with Cornelius. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was that just to give him some understanding for later, or was it... Well, for yeah. his I don't, we, don't, we don't have time to discuss him. that issue in great depth, but Peter was so, so careful when he went to see Cornelius. What did he do when, on his way? Do you remember? Took witnesses with him. He took witnesses. six other Jewish believers with him to make sure that no one could question his, his, his testimony. Amazing. Well, there's another thing. You know, the sheet that came down with the unclean animals, mm -hmm. that was Peter's vision. Yeah. So it's almost like there, there needed to be a connection with the people that would work with the Gentiles with, with that. And I think you, that... Yeah, you, you would have thought that Peter would have seen that. Yeah, okay, now that, that question is settled. But that was before what happened in Antioch. Maybe all that was just priming him for the... Jerusalem Conference. Well, they had the Jerusalem Conference and some, let's see, it would be now about um, seven or eight years later, Paul came back to Jerusalem again and I want you to read, I want to read something here. Paul came back to Jerusalem again and the people in Jerusalem, these leaders, presumably it's Peter and John, and who knows what else, although we know that by that time there were actually priests, Jewish priests had become believers, there were Jewish Pharisees who had become believers, whether they were the primary movers in this case. But this is what Ellen White says, many of the Jews who had accepted the gospel still cherished a regard for the ceremonial law and were only too willing to make unwise concessions, hoping thus to gain the confidence of their countrymen. In other words, they wanted to they want to do something that will make it easier for them to spread the gospel to the Jews, to remove their prejudice and to win them to faith in Christ as the world's redeemer. Paul realized that so long as many of the leading members of the church at Jerusalem should continue to cherish prejudice against him, they would work constantly to counteract his influence. Now this is the time just before he gets arrested. He felt that if by any reasonable concession he could win them to the truth, he would remove a great obstacle to the success of the gospel in other places. Now he's concerned about how the gospel is spreading out in other spots. But he was not authorized of God to concede as much as they asked. Paul was not authorized by God to compromise with the church leaders in Jerusalem. And where were you reading from? That's Acts of the Apostles, page 405. And you read the whole context, the whole story starts on page 400 up to 405. And I think later on uh, she says when he appeals to Caesar that that was a mistake also. Well, yeah, yeah it, it was a... It was his mistake. That was, that was a difficult thing because to keep from being sent back to Jerusalem, he appeals to Caesar. But then later, the people who were supposed to take him to Caesar said, we don't see any reason why this guy should even be in prison. But he's already appealed to Caesar, so it was a, you know. Well, um, if you could hear Peter and listen to him, and then you could hear Paul and listen to him, do you think you would detect a huge difference in their Gospels? Well, no. I don't think there would be. It's, Sometimes I wonder if maybe Peter thinks that when you're converted after a while you'd start acting a certain way and he was a little disappointed at that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, <coughs> if, like you get this idea that if a Gentile is, is converted then after a while they start moving into being more like a Jew or something like that because they have the truth of course and um, if that didn't happen uh, I wonder if you would start getting nervous about that, if these guys are really being converted. Do you think it's uh, still true that, uh, like Paul and Barnabas did, that uh, we should periodically consult with the 
church leaders to see if we're preaching the true gospel? No, I don't think it. I don't think that was what they were trying to do. They were. Th that's they what were they, thinking that's what about. They claimed they were trying to do. Yeah, but when two people get together, they both do influences on each other. That's how it's supposed to go. Maybe the meet in the middle type of thing. It isn't that they go over there and and make sure everything is is okay with these guys. Don't but, you wish? You know, there's more information yeah. that happens when they're out in the Gentile world all kinds of things happening they come together and they share everything and they should come to some sort of consensus yeah it would be nice so you read just a moment ago about how the church leaders were wrong in Paul's day could they be wrong today now Gordon why did all you have to ask that well all of us could be wrong <laughs> yeah in fact we could can be wrong. we can all be right in so, in some piece and wrong in another way and that's one of on Satan's the, favorite tricks. On, on, the, on the other side, you, yeah. and so you have to find what is the thing that uh, we need to. Where are the find. core? Where is the core message? Yeah. Yeah. Don't Could you wish you had a recording of those discussions between Paul and the church leaders? Mm -hmm. I want you to think about this here. Here's Paul, who has had an incredible. I mean, this guy is university postgraduate education. And he's having a discussion with Galilean fishermen. Yeah. How, how do you think they related to each other? Well, I, I've heard ministers uh, years before in my lifetime bring this very thing up. And I've wondered how that would match because the way Paul writes these letters, you know he's an educated man and you must figure that even though Christ had a good effect on the disciples and the Sanhedrin knew it and they admitted it, mm -hmm. their gr grasp of language and, and moving internationally, that kind of thing, must have been different. Yeah. Well, um, another question I would like to, ha I would like to know, it's, this is not an essential thing, but obviously the Jewish people and maybe even some of the Jewish believers were sending out these so-called Judaizers to follow Paul around, go to these churches, even Antioch and so forth, to try to convince people that if you're going to be a real Christian, you've got to go all the way and get circumcised and all that kind of stuff. Do you think that uh, Peter or John or Paul knew any of these Judaizers personally? Sure. Possibility. Where did, where did Paul get his version of the Gospel? From God. From the Spirit. Yes. You think he, he got it through, obviously he didn't get it in that minute or two being hit by the light, so he got it out considering thinking about the Old Testament in, in Arabia, he got it from further revelations of God, because he talks about other times when God Second speaks verse. to him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was caught up to the third. Did he get it from Barnabas and others that he associated with? Well, you know, if if you had a certain paradigm before, everything you had a world, a certain world view, and it wasn't God wasn't anything like Jesus, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden, Jesus was the guy, mm -hmm. and then you put it in that old world view. You don't. I mean, it just takes a a while to straighten everything out again. I don't yeah. think there's there needs Is to it? be that much stuff coming in to help him change it. I mean, Jesus is like the pill you drop into the water and then it starts fizzing. Yeah. You know? So you got, um, you got a fruit basket upset, basically. That's what Paul Yeah, had. and you got to straighten it all back up again. Only, only this time you've got Jesus there yeah. instead of... Yeah. He had all that knowledge from, about the Old Testament, yes. uh, about God, mm -hmm. about Jesus in the Old Testament, and uh, he just had to rearrange it a little bit. But you okay, asked, a lot. You asked how Paul related with the Galilean fishermen. Mm -hmm. If you were the educated person that you are, and you went to someone who had spent time with Christ, you'd yeah. have great respect for someone who had spent actual time and learned their gospel from the teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Well, it. it I'd have to pull it up here, but when uh, Paul then was converted and he started 
uh, speaking in Damascus. I, I don't know if that was before when he came back or before he left, yeah. but he was arguing from the scriptures mm -hmm. that Jesus was the Christ. And yeah. and in in the in Acts 15, where Peter is part of the discussion, he talks about uh, the Cornelius experience and said, uh, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way that uh, they also are. So he he uh, had a grasp on the gospel. Yeah. You know, well. I could I can't help but think when Paul goes back to Jerusalem, and they start talking about these things that Paul had experienced. I don't think Peter discussed back and forth. He could probably say, you know, I remember when Jesus did this and did that. It was kind of similar to that. And probably Paul listened to that too. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't necessarily that Peter was telling him what to do or what was right or wrong. He he was just a witness to mm. what Jesus did, and I. That's one reason I'd go back. Yeah. And see him because why, I why? like to hear those stories. Yeah. Why do you suppose Paul said, "I went to see the leaders of the church, Peter, John, and James." It really doesn't matter to me what who they were. Is that a very well, respectful way to... Then? Why would he go back there? I, I'm yeah. saying this is what he wrote about a long time later. Yeah. I didn't take it that way. You didn't take it that way? Well, when I first read it, I, I thought that. And then I thought, he's referring to quotes, somebody saying this is a leader of the church, mm -hmm. rather than being... A disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I toned it down a bit in my thinking that he wasn't really referring to um, Peter and James as saying that they were leaders of the church. It was others that were mm -hmm. saying they were leaders. Okay. Well, they were prominent because they had been with Jesus. I mean, yeah, yeah. They, that would just sort of give you yeah. this presence that yeah. that somebody yeah. off the street wouldn't have. So. But if others were saying that they were leaders and hadn't had that experience. Yeah. I don't know if there was some kind of vote taken matter. back there. You know, yeah. Did they really vote on who was in charge of what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe they, you know, uh, had some kind of informal, we'll, let, we'll have James lead us out or, or something yeah. mm -hmm. like that. But I don't know if there was any anything more than that. Why do you think God gave circumcision back in the beginning? There's probably There's other kinds issues. of lessons in it. There's lessons about the flesh. There's lessons about... There's all kinds of things. The scholars who've looked at that think that probably one of the main reasons was that the young men who were Jews couldn't go off and carry on with the people in the fertility cult religions it would be obvious that they were Jews. Well, what, what good is that? Well, hopefully it'll... Just it's put a tattoo on your arm, say Jew. Yeah. And that's all I need. So that's what you're saying? It, yeah. it was just a big tattoo type of thing? Yeah. Mm, could be, I don't know. Well, well it didn't I'm... didn't stop them some, uh, quite a lot of the time. Didn't <laughs> stop them. Well, is there anything wrong with being circumcised? Depends what they did it with. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could also be a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly circumcision was only intended for the male descendants of Abraham. What about, what about the women? Nothing in the Bible. I want to make this very clear. Some of you have read stories, terrible stories in, in recent times, and this has been going on for a long time in Arab-dominated countries where they, quote, circumcise women. There is nothing like that in the Bible in any of this whatsoever. So I want to make that very clear. Um, well, the question, of course, was does outward circumcision really imply circumcision of the heart? And what's circumcision of the heart? I'm, I'm trying to ask all the easy questions. Well, yeah. a natural man is, you know, we die, yeah. we consider ourselves dead to sin, and so that might be what it's talking about, casting off and considering yeah. as dead the, the old man of sin. The bad mm -hmm. stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that you can walk in newness of life. 
Well, th does, uh, does uh, circumcision then represent salvation by works? It depends on the time. I think that's that's what, <laughs> kind of what I was alluding to earlier. Yeah. I think some of those very righteous Pharisees and all that, that was part of their whole persona. Mm -hmm. I give the best offering, I do this, I do that, I'm circumcised, I wear the right kind of clothing and all this stuff. Yeah. Does it represent a kind of confidence what we can do as opposed to a total dependence on what Christ has done and will do for us? And of course that's we're getting now into semantics here. What does it have to do with our picture of God? Here's an interesting comment about that. Clearly circumcision was a prized sign of Jewish national identity. Approximately 150 years before Jesus' birth, Palestinian Jews forced all males living in their territories and even some in surrounding nations which fell under their jurisdiction to be circumcised. They just said, you don't have any choice, we're circumcising you. Some believed it was essential for salvation. There are even ancient epic epigrams declaring, quote, circumcised men do not descend into Gehenna or hell. That's from a critical and exegetical commentary on the Epistle of Romans, and so forth. Was that kind of like marching an army into the water and baptizing them all? It's kind of like that. Okay, let's be clear on a couple things. Was, was Paul circumcised? Probably. Absolutely. He says so, he absolutely. Says so. He what? says so. Was Peter circumcised? Sure. Yeah. Why did Paul require Timothy to be circumcised? His father was Greek. He wasn't circumcised until Paul came along. Mother and grandmother. Were they were Jew. Jewish, yes. Probably to, to avoid some unnecessary trouble. In what way? Well, the same way that been happening afterwards where people are are making people saying that you need to be circumcised. But he, he, he also associated with Titus and he, Titus was never circumcised. Well that was later. Well not that much later. Well how late, much later do you need it for it to be? In fact different. I think Ti Titus was with Paul before Timothy was. Mm -hmm. Yeah he was. So what was the difference? Timothy was a Jew, Titus was not. Well, Timothy was half Jew. That's a Jew. Okay. But think about this. Paul was planning to use Timothy to work with Jews. And what happens if you ask somebody who's not circumcised to work with Jews? He's chased out of town, right? So if you want, if you want someone to work with Jews, you've got to say, okay, we, we're going we're gonna to meet you as a Jew with Jews. Titus, did, no, he never asked Titus to work with the Jews. He, asked, he sent Titus to places where there were Gentile churches. He didn't need to be circumcised. Well, then you're making my point, just to, to avoid trouble. Well, okay, that's what, yeah. No, I, I'm not arguing <laughs> with that a bit. So the issue really was Jewish prejudice and bigotry. Well, um, well good thing we don't have any of that. Yeah. <laughs> you think they understood what Jewish bigotry was back then? How, how would they understand that? I think Paul understood it. Well, he probably did, but all the people that were that needed to understand it, it didn't. Yeah, sure. So, well, what makes somebody bigoted? It's I, I don't, don't know. None of us ever have anything to do with anybody who's bigger well, than mine. <laughs> is it the way they hold their mouth or what? It's just... <laughs> but think back in, uh, when in David's time and Solomon's time, they conquered these nations around them, and yes, God told them to do it. But even then, you don't have to be a religious bigot to not have be a bigot. They always felt, I think you'll find, superior to the ones they conquered. That's mm -hmm. a kind of a bigotry. It really is. Yeah. Bigotry, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of an elitist it's, thing, it's, yeah, yeah. isn't it? It's almost inbred in all of us. Yeah, yeah. Superiority. Which Paul had said, but you pointed out, that everything buddy is supposed to be, mm -hmm. treat each other the same. So they're having a hard time having that happen, it looks like. 
Is there a difference between salvation by faith alone and salvation by faith plus a little bit of works? Without, without <laughs> work, there's no <laughs> exercise. Of, isn't uh, faith an action word? It means supposed you be doing something. Well, faith has a lot to do with being saved, but what are you being saved into? So you can do works later. Do, any, do we as Seventh-day Adventists have any identifying marks that set us apart from other churches? Of course. Well, yes, but it depends on what you mean by salvation. I mean, if you define mm -hmm. salvation as being able to go to heaven in some time in the future. I think that's a pretty I good think definition. That's, that's kind of where, but... Uh, but, salvation uh, with is salvation, the, isn't it? It doesn't yeah. matter if you're going to heaven. That just means that you're going to be living. Well, Keep living. Let me finish the point that, that uh, with the reception of the Holy Spirit, uh, our new life begins. So we have entered into new life. So salvation begins at that point. Uh, whether we, now that, as Adventists, we don't believe in once saved, always saved. We can... Uh, Refuse we're better because we keep the Sabbath. But isn't one reason well, why this, the, the Holy Spirit comes in is because we have faith? Well, yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there, uh, we usually think of salvation. You know, I'll get to heaven by and by if I do these things or, yeah. or not, you know, or the what. Whereas uh, I think what Paul is talking about with salvation is is the reception of the Holy Spirit. You know, the, Peter said, the Spirit fell on them just mm -hmm. as it fell on us, and they're circumcised, I mean uncircumcised, and then we Maybe baptized them. the Holy them. Spirit couldn't tell the difference. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, God is no respecter of persons. Yeah. So, uh, so the salvation begins and I, at that point, and I think that's what it's talking about. You... You don't have to do all these things and then get mm -hmm. uh, God's blessing. He is able to give it to you as soon we, as you respond. We have a things. fairly long list of things we think people should do to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do you think uh, most of those are necessary for salvation? They get longer as time The goes list gets longer. <laughs> time goes I think yeah. a little book. I think Christ put it <laughs> toward the end of his ministry. When the young gentleman came and asked him what he should do, mm -hmm. I keep the commandments, and Christ said, love, you love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the works we're supposed to be doing, yeah. if you want to use the word works. And he also said somewhere in there, look, we've several times in his ministry, we are supposed to look after the less fortunate. Yeah. You know? will, there, will there come a time when... Um we have to stand up for what's right, even opposing others who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists? I think it's possible, yeah. Like, uh, well, that's White, pretty general. What do you Ellen White says that? that some of our brightest lights will go out. Yeah. What okay. does that mean? That's what it says. Some of the leading clergy or leading professionals, whatever, you only got to look at what happened in Germany in World War II to see mm -hmm. where that goes. Mm -hmm. Adventist Germans, there were a few that uh, didn't go with it. They got out of the country, but they basically turned their back on what we would have taught. Paul talks a lot in, in uh, look at particularly Galatians 2, 4 here in our context. Although some wanted Titus to be circumcised, pretending to be fellow believers, these men slipped into our group as spies in order to find out about the freedom we have through our union with Christ Jesus. They wanted to make slaves of us. What's the freedom that we have? It's kind of hard to, to, to understand his metaphor. There's a whole bunch of verses here if you want to look at them. Well, it's kind of hard to, to understand the metaphor, though, mm -hmm. of, of spies coming in to spy out their freedom. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see that? Without I, being I, a I am sure that there were groups of Pharisees among the Christians in Jerusalem that said, we're going we're gonna to appoint a committee to follow Titus around and see if we can figure out if he's circumcised. Okay, so if he is circumcised, that means he had the freedom to do it? So is that what Paul says? To spy out our freedom and... 
Well, Paul says we're going to treat him just like a Christian brother, even though he's not circumcised. Is that freedom? Oh, yeah, it's freedom to not be circumcised. Okay. So is that what they were looking for as they went in to spy to see that they weren't well, and requiring circumcision? Mm -hmm. At the Jerusalem Council in, in chapter 15 of Acts, yeah. uh, Peter says uh, he made no distinction between us and them cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? So mm -hmm. that might have something to do with the f idea of freedom. That's yeah. a good point. But That's a good point. Isn't it, I think you mentioned in your notes, uh, freedom from the slavery of sin and in the long term, hopefully freedom from the rulers of this planet. Allah, mm -hmm. the devil, and his angels. That's what it's talking about in the main. Okay. Well, Christian freedom, in, in the broadest sense, what does it mean? Can a Christian do whatever he wants to do? A real Christian? I would say yes. Yeah. He can do what he wants to because a real Christian understands what is right, to do and why it is right and he chooses to do it because it is right it's the right thing to do so therefore he never chooses the wrong thing to do because he knows those things are wrong so he's free to do whatever he wants that is he's free to do the right if we know christ is it is our privilege to know him right. we right. our life will be a life of continual obedience and, mm -hmm. um, is our major 668 mm -hmm. yeah. carrying out our own impulses we'll be doing the will of God. It, it wasn't that what Christ did. He knew what was right and he did it. No matter what anyone else tried to say or tempt him or whatever. So how do you learn what's right? So you can do all that thing, stuff you, that you're you, you, you You look at the life of Jesus Christ. You look at it? Mm -hmm. well, what about and you say, these? I want to be like Jesus as much as possible. Okay, but uh, we're talking about people that didn't have a New Testament back then. Yeah. And you've got Jews going all over the place. How, mm -hmm. how do they go to that life and, and look at it? What did Jesus say? The eternal life is to know the Father and mm -hmm. Jesus Christ to whom he had sent. Yeah. And to know means you have to immerse yourself in it. Maybe he says, if you eat my blood, excuse me, eat my flesh and drink my blood, I'll ra raise you in the last day. Uh, it's not all that. Uh, Romans ten seventeen, Sanctify them through thy truth. In other words, make them holy make them dedicated to God through the truth. And what is the truth? Thy word is truth. Thy word mm -hmm. is truth. They had the Old Testament. Now, God isn't saying that we all need to be cookie-cutter Christians, that, okay, just stamp us out, we're all exactly alike. No, <clears throat> you know, places like 1 Corinthians 12 say, we're different. We're like, and he uses the illustration of the body, of course, the eye and the ear and the arm and the foot and so forth. He uses these things to say, we're not asking you all to be exactly alike. You each have your own separate talents, be yourselves, but we all need to be to follow Jesus Christ. Um, I'm still trying to think of this track for these new conversions that they're mm -hmm. doing things right. How do they know that they're doing things right? Well, I mean, look at, look at Paul. I mean, it takes he did everything while. wrong for a little while, didn't he? Yeah, After he heard true. about the truth. That's true. So it sounds to me like you can be free to do anything, and if you do something wrong, well, then you'll get binged on the head, and mm -hmm. then you'll straighten up, right? <laughs> All encouraged. <laughs> that's one possibility. It happened well, for Well, that's how you learn, isn't it? Yeah. So as long as you're heading for the truth. Yeah. Paul put himself yeah. out as an example, for, mm -hmm. you know, of what to do and yeah. how to behave. And then, of course, he wrote letters. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when he spoke, he appealed to the writings of the Old Testament. Well, I, I want to start applying this to some of the issues that, in our church today. Let's think about some of the issues affecting our church. There are some of us who are a little older in age that are not super excited about some of the methods being used to try to attract young people for example. And some of the young people are not 
excited about some of the methods that we think are appropriate among the older ones. Um, do we have a right to say to somebody else who's trying to reach out and spread the gospel, you're, you, you're doing it the wrong way? Who makes that? We're talking about freedom here, okay? Hmm? Well, we Who makes that judgment? That's what I'm asking you. Someone, someone else from Australia was saying how when he was being a youth pastor that some of the uh, brethren said these new songs should not be sung, you know, and they, he said, well, which song should we sing? And, and they pointed to a few songs and he remembered that those songs were looked down on when, when they were new. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. I... I read something interesting, it was interesting to me, and it was written not by an Adventist, I don't know what religious persuasion, but was writing about the current youth as we see them today, and you can figure a generation or two before those. The point was made they can't even concentrate on a job because half the time that they're using computers and they're doing their own shopping in the boss's time and all this, but when it comes to focusing on stuff, it's just not there like it used to be because yeah. they are so used to all this other Everything stuff is sound around bites. them. Yeah. And, and videos uh, I think and that's movies are, mm. have quick, I, quick uh, cuts. Mm -hmm. Yes. A, and I mean, there's a mixture, but I think that contributes to what we're starting to see cuts. in church. If we are not, if we personally are not doing anything to spread the gospel. Do we have a, r a right to criticize anybody, even though they may be using methods we don't approve of, of trying to spread the gospel? Yeah, you don't want to discourage them even, you know, otherwise they might give up and do nothing. So there, yeah. there has to be yeah. some in, in tactful the, way of, yeah. of maybe redirecting their... In the past, Adventists have really gotten, got almost stuck on conducting campaigns or crusades or efforts of some kind. And we think, boy, this is, this is the method. You know, we, this is what we need to do. We now know that doesn't work very well anymore. It, we, we, it seemed to work back in the days before there was radio and television and movies and all that kind of stuff where there was nothing much else going on. So someone comes to town, puts up a big tent, and starts preaching. Everybody wants to come out and hear what they have to say. It doesn't work like that anymore. So uh, what method should we be using today? Well, Christ's method. <laughs> there you go. I think you have oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he, he got close to them, understood their needs, etc. Healed them. Made, made their, tried to meet their needs, won their friendship, and then bid them follow me, or words to that effect anyway. I think you have to be adaptable to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. There's risks to that. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we're seeing a bit of that here and there. But so now, having spoken a little bit about Christian freedom, what about Christian unity? Um, I spent many years working in other parts of the world, com the almost the other side of the planet where approaches to things are very different than they are here. Do we, how do we, how do we maintain the unity in our church when people have come from such different backgrounds? <coughs> well, what unifies the church? What is supposed to unify That's the That's my church? question. Well, the spirit, uh, we, I mean, you have to go back to God as the ultimate uh, one. Unity, speaking of being one, and Jesus' prayer for the church in John mm -hmm. 17, that they might be one even as we are one. So, and mm -hmm. then Paul in Ephesians 4 says to be earnest to preserve the unity of the Spirit. In other words, if we're in the Spirit, the, the unity exists there. Mm -hmm. It's when we turn and, and go our, our own way. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, but sometimes let our pride get, ri run away with us. Yeah. Sometimes you get people coming together with different ideas, and the different ideas is what spreads them apart. Yeah. I mean, pu pulls them apart. It shouldn't be the ideas. Everybody, if it, if they should be doing it right, they should be listening 
mm -hmm. to ideas and um, working them out, right? But if everybody looks at each other as Christ looks at everybody, mm -hmm. there would always be unity even if they didn't agree on anything, let don't me, you think? Let me ask you this question. You know the story of Peter, about Paul condemning Peter to his face in public, etc. Do you think you would more likely be a Peter or a Paul in that story? Depends on the subject. Probably. No, I mean, I mean suppose you'd been there in the church in Antioch, and here's Peter that's slipping back. He's trying not, he's not eating with Gentiles anymore, and Paul just comes up and lays him out right there in front of people. Would you do that, or would you more likely end up doing what Peter did? Are you asking me if I criticize anyone else? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so maybe I I'm like Paul. Yeah, I know that in my flesh there is no good thing, and that mm -hmm. good thing would be to be like P Peter did, which would be to just kind of not ruffle the water or, you know, just try to go along with, with mm -hmm. the people that I, I was closer to, I felt closer to. And, but that isn't the way uh, I'm, of the new We've we got people that are different, you know. Some people are, tend, to, tend to be like Peter, and there's some mm -hmm. people that tend to be like Paul. That's why I asked the question I did. Well, are you, are you suggesting that somehow we all melt and become the same? Well, I mean, that's the question. Do we, yeah. God doesn't say we should all melt and just be all like each other. He said... You know, the old eyes and ears and hands and feet and kind of illustration. Clearly, we're not supposed to be all the same. And, and you know, some are prophets, some are apostles, some are da-da-da. Remember those statements? I think um, we had... I some have a whip in their belt. <laughs> I, I think there are certain levels of unity. Mm -hmm. And I think there are certain core beliefs using our own church. We pretty much stick to them. But I think it, uh, what we don't seem to hear much of anymore, maybe I'm wrong, if you look at the tenets or the rules, the Book of Rules in the United Nations, mm -hmm. they want a one world government. And uh, friends, of, friends, quote unquote, in other religions are going to be in on that like a fly to honey. And this is where it comes down to us as individuals eventually. We're going to be put in those individual situations. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at some examples that, that would bear, parallel some of the things that happened with Peter and Paul. In the Jewish synagogue scattered around through the Mediterranean world, you as a Gentile could come in, you could participate in the worship service, but unless you were circumcised, circumcised you, came to, you, you, you were regarded as a God-fearer, but you weren't a first-class saint. If you really wanted to be a first-class saint, you had to go all the way, get circumcised, etc., etc. Some of Paul's critics tried to ter carry that idea into the Christian church, saying, if you want to be a real Christian, you're going to get circumcised, you're going to do all that kind of stuff. Do we have any things like that going on in our church today? We're way mean? beyond that. Way beyond, okay. <laughs> You mean, so what do you think is the equivalent of circumcision today? Well, I'm going to I'm going to take a moment since we're running out of time here and read some passages. Um, how do we deal with women in our church and their roles and their positions? Well, we recently took a vote in the general conference that was supposed to resolve that issue. Well, here's what Ellen White said about that. Not that particular vote, but one like it. We cannot then take a position that the unity of the church consists in viewing every text of Scripture in the very same light. The church may pass resolution upon resolution to put down all disagreement of opinions, but we cannot force the mind and will and thus root out disagreement. These resolutions may conceal the discord, but they cannot quench it and establish perfect agreement. Nothing can perfect unity in the church but the spirit of Christ-like forbearance. Satan can sow discord, Christ alone can harmonize the disagreeing elements. Then let every soul sit down at Christ's school and learn of Christ, who declares himself to be meek and lowly of heart. Christ says that if we learn of him, worries will cease and we shall find rest in our souls. That's Ellen G. White in an article entitled, 
Biblical Council on Solving Church Difficulties, written in 1889, shortly after the 1880 General Conference. Hmm, I wonder if that's significant. <coughs> and then here's another one she wrote. Even the best of men, if left to themselves, will make grave blunders. The more responsibilities placed upon the human agent, the higher his position to dictate and control, the more mischief he is sure to do, and perverting minds and hearts if he does not carefully follow the way of the Lord. At Antioch, Peter failed in the principles of integrity. Paul had to withstand his subverting influence face to face. This is recorded that others may profit by it and that the lesson may be a solemn warning to the men in high places that they may not fail in, in integrity but keep close to principle. Do we have any problems like that in our church today? I mean, what's happened is our church is becoming more and more diverse. We are becoming more and more a church of third world countries. Do we solve religious questions, real theological questions by taking a vote at the General Conference? Do we succumb to peer pressure? Well, customs have changed a lot in our church over the last 50 years. I mean, I can remember when I was a child, a lot of things that are considered to be perfectly normal now were not accepted. Does that mean we're losing our way? Does that mean that we're succumbing to peer pressure? We know that Peter later was very friendly to Paul, and it's, it's even possible that Peter wrote his second epistle to the Peter, uh, to the people, um, while he was in the Mamertine prison, and possibly while Paul was sitting there. Interesting. So, um, well, those who believe in the larger view, great controversy, trust healing model of the plan of salvation, as we try to present it here, may be viewed by some as splitters. Are we, on the, are we an outlier or are we at the core of the gospel? That's the question I'd like you to think about as you listen to our discussions. Are we in need of change as a church? Is our unity truly based on unity in Christ? Are we, where are we? You make that decision yourself and you make that choice. Our kind and wonderful Father, We look back at the history of the Christian church and we weep. Not because there haven't been some great stalwarts, some people who have done wonderful things, but because so many have just compromised with the world. And now, Lord, we're on the stage. It's our turn. Are we prepared to stand straight and tall for what we know is right? Or are we going to bow to peer pressure? How much longer do we need to wait before you come again? We need to ask ourselves that question every day, and may that be our experience. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.